first case to come before the court is uh, State versus McNeil. And uh, we just have the uh, appellant arguing this morning. So when you're ready, you're ready to proceed. You have 15 minutes, obviously. Thank you. Thank you. If it pleases the court, I'm Jerry Lightley, and I'm here representing the defendant appellant, in this case, David McNeil. As you know, I was not the trial counsel and was appointed to process this appeal after the verdict was issued in the Harvard Municipal Court. My client was charged with one of the offenses under 291925 of the Ohio Revised Code, Section C in this case, so that it was suggested that he knowingly caused his wife, a family or household member, to believe he would cause her eminent physical harm. That's the section under which he was charged as a misdemeanor uh, under the Ohio Revised Code. The first thing I'd like to talk about is that in Ohio, conditional threats are not sufficient to create a fear of imminent or immediate physical harm. In the transcript, it's pretty clear that although the parties weren't getting along that day, the trouble developed when the wife said something my client considered to be very unkind about his mother. And that's where the threats ensued. So that even in both briefs, I think you'll find the language, if you say one more thing about my mother, I'm going to fill in the blanks, the terrible things that were going to happen. And I've cited in the brief the Ohio cases that relate to this and support that position. And they dealt with questions like, if you try and contact my daughter again, I will fill in the blank. If you as soon as I make bail, I am going to, and then the magic words. If you don't get me out of here, he said to the police in another case, I will, and then the threat followed. And those were cases which were held to be conditional threats that were insufficient to create fear of imminent physical harm on behalf of the wife. And those, I think, are quite significant in this case. The second reason I think Eddie Benetti's Rule 29 motion should have been sustained either at the end of the plaintiff's case or at the close of the case is because this was the fourth time the same habit appeared on behalf of the wife. It was obvious by now that she knew she could get him out of the house and so she used it as she had used in the past uh, this method for putting the end to an argument. I point out also... Was he convicted of those prior offenses? Uh, yes, he was. Okay. And they recited, They didn't give us the dates, but they did refer to them and entered them as exhibits in the early part of the hearing. I saw that in the transcript. That's correct. Well, the reason I ask that, because um, he was convicted of those prior offenses, at least DV menacing, I would assume, something to that effect. Um, you're indicating that that was a mechanism she used to get him out of the house. Well, then she hoodwinked the court system three times previously? Yes. <laughs> okay, Tom. And in this case, to add to that conversation, she didn't call the police, she called her buddy. Mm -hmm. If uh, the name was Desi Sanders. And it was Desi Sanders who said, well, call the police. But her first thought was to call a witness who might then hear him raving in the background and be a witness if she needed her in the future. My belief is that had she really been in fear of eminent physical harm, the call would have been to the police and not to her buddy, Desi Sanders. I'd like to go back if you don't care, counsel, because um, it is, I think, very interesting with this conditional threat type thing. Yes. Um, in the cases that you cite, talk about <clears throat> some kind of threat that's going to happen in the future based on conduct that the, the victim right. might engage in. Um, but the, the examples that you gave all relate to um, really 
future type events, like like you said, um, when I get out on bail or something like that. Um, don't you take in consideration when they're one on one and facing each other, physically present, and um, wouldn't that the condition the conditionalness of the threat be dependent on the circumstances as they exist at that moment? Probably so. This one strikes me as being very similar to the one where the police were there and he said to the police, if you don't get me out of here, I will kill her. And that was a condition that immediately got corrected because the police arrested him. And in this case, it immediately got corrected because she apologized for what she had been saying about his mother and that ended the incidents. And the transcript shows that both from the testimony of Desi Sanders as well as the testimony of the wife. But he was, uh, as I recall, he was very worked up prior to her even saying anything about Yes, mom. they had argued over going to dinner that night with his boss or her going out with uh, her friends and then some accusation one way or the other that he'd been hitting on her friend. They had those kind of conversations all day. and. It didn't get to threatening problems until the, the issue came up when he said something, she said something about his mother that he didn't like. But now, yeah. the state indicates that he also um, didn't condition the threats just on his mom, uh, but also uh, said if you say one more word, I'm going to kick you, for instance. Well, I, I'm assuming because it was said one more word about my mom, too, that that was just a, a shortened example of the same issue. The issue, clearly from the transcript, was this is what you're saying about my mom, and I'm not going to tolerate it any further. And I don't, I don't know exactly what he had said, and I don't know that any of us do, but it, it's pretty clearly pointed toward remarks he made about his mother. I guess I'm just a little concerned with the situation where somebody, male or female, is in a situation where someone is obviously very upset, very agitated. Um, whether these were legitimate or not, prior convictions of domestic violence involving this individual. Uh, of the menace. Menace domestic violence menacing involving this individual. And um, so you're, I feel like you're walking around on eggshells because if you say something, it may be interpreted um, as, as against his mom or might agitate him in some other way. Is that how we want um, you know, to interpret the domestic violence menacing no. statute? No, we don't. And had she not referred specifically to his mother, you wouldn't have that case. But even with his mom, you know, maybe she says, well, your mom's a lovely lady. He says, what do you mean by that? <laughs> that doesn't appear to be, the transcript doesn't reflect it was that sort of a conversation about his mom. I'm sure it's very fast. It's yes, okay. specific here. So the, those three reasons, the, the um, conditional threat, the fact that it had been used before and the fact that if she were in really in fear, she would have called the police and not her buddy. Those are my main reasons for believing that the threat did not cause the wife, in this case, to believe that he would cause her imminent physical harm. What, 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 how do you respond to the, uh, the officer testifying that when he arrived at the scene, that she was frantic. I, I have no idea. I, I know the officer also testified that when she called the police, she was not frantic. She was, I think he had other words, uh, determined and intense about it, but he didn't notice any frantic feelings from her voice when the initial call was made to the police department. That appears to be a much different mental state than later when he showed up. And the last thing that concerns me in this case is um, not that I'm excited about it, but I think it happened. I believe.
believe the trial court used the prior convictions as a method of finding guilt. The uh, prior convictions under Ohio Evidence Rule 404B has a very limited purpose. And I've quoted the finding of the trial judge when he said, I think the state of Ohio has proven this case beyond a reasonable doubt. I'm going to find that Mr. McNeil on the day did commit the act of threatening. And inasmuch as there are three prior convictions, if you raise this to this level, I'm going to find Mr. McNeil guilty of that offense. That's where I think it's pretty obvious that he used the prior convictions not for the purpose of motive, opportunity, intent, preparation, plan, knowledge, or mistake, as listed by Rule 404B, but it seems pretty clear he used the prior convictions as evidence of guilt in this case to justify his opinion. And for those reasons, it's my hope that the Court of Appeals will reverse the conviction in the Barber Municipal Court, and I thank you for your consideration. Well, thank you, counsel. Um, the court will take the matter under advisement. Okay. We will issue a written opinion that will be sent out to you as well as the state of Ohio. Thank and you, you can check on the websites. I will. It's good.